Good morning and uh, very welcome to all of you on the second exceptional day of this exceptional event uh, for the conference Fantasies of Capital, Alienation, Enjoyment, Psychoanalysis. I think it's a very prestigious event also for the city of Mumbai that at this one point in time we have such you know, fantastic scholars, uh, you know, thinkers and philosophers all present at this moment with us and we thank Grand Prava for the same thing. Um, today I have the privilege of uh, introducing one of them, uh, Dr. Professor Aaron Schuster. He says he doesn't like to be called a philosopher, but I would like to say he's a great no, no, that's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. No. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know what else I would do. <laughs> So who is a visiting professor at the University of Chicago, German, Germanic Studies and the Frank Institute of the Humanities. He's a former fellow at the Institute of Cultural Inquiry, ICI Berlin, and the Institute for Advanced Studies, Rijeka, and head of theory programs at Sandberg Institute, Amsterdam. Uh, more importantly, I think he's just come out with his very interesting book just a few months ago, The Trouble with the Pleasure, the Lewis and Psychoanalysis, in which he talks about nature of pleasure and desire. And uh, he says that, of course, you know, one thinks that, you know, pleasure is everyone needs pleasure and everyone avoids pain, but it's not as simplistic as that. He quite complicates it. And his, uh, you know, the first chapter is about complaining and how all of us enjoy and derive pleasure or desire pleasure out of complaining. And it sounds very interesting and I hope we can all get a copy of the same. And I also asked him that what he really likes doing besides thinking and theorizing and his interest is in visual arts and culture and uh, he likes actually enjoys teaching philosophy at a dance uh, school and works with children on art projects which I thought was interesting. Uh, his today's uh, paper The Dead Drive Philosophical Anthropology and Political Economy deals with the kinds of subjectivity in contemporary political economy and the relationship of human nature and capitalism. Human nature and capitalism is an interesting thing which you'd like mm. to know. With that, I quite hand over the Great. mic to you to let us know what you're thinking. Thank okay. you very much. Great, so thanks a lot. Um, and thanks to the Institute for organizing this, Rohit. I mean, this incredible event and also it's my first time um, not only in Mumbai but in India and I'm still I have to say quite overwhelmed um, and still trying to kind of gain my bearings here so let me just launch right into the into the paper so today I wish to outline um, a kind of general hypothesis concerning the current stage of capitalism which is commonly designated with the term neoliberalism and um, let me start with um, in his highly influential, if contested, lecture course from 1978 to 1979, which is titled somewhat confusingly, The Birth of Biopolitics, Michel Foucault argued that neoliberalism should be understood not simply as an economic doctrine, but as an art of government or governmentality. And Foucault even forwards a kind of quasi-Kantian definition of neoliberalism, which I would formulate as follows. It's not religion within the limits of reason alone, but rather politics within the limits of economics alone. Um, that's to say that neoliberalism is a doctrine for the proper exercise of politics within a strictly delimited economic frame. So economics becomes the regulative reason of politics, and to transgress this reason even and especially in the name of the social good, is basically to court disaster, you know, from the humdrum inefficiency uh, to the catastrophic totalitarianism. And uh, the other interesting, you know, where Foucault is, I think, at his strongest is finding unexpected analogies between different kind of bodies of thought or different thinkers. So the other interesting and very unexpected philosophical resonance that Foucault identifies is actually to Husserlian phenomenology. Um, just like the latter, neoliberalism combats naturalism, but in the sphere of economy. So it's as if the German, like, ordo liberals bracketed the naturalistic assumptions of classical liberalism in order to kind of intuit the market as a formal construct 
construct or mental essence. So this would make the Chicago School the purveyors of a kind of economic epoche or kind of economic phenomenological reduction, uh, a pure consciousness of social inequalities in an ideal state of competition. Okay. Now, as Foucault makes clear in his methodological remarks in one of the early sessions of the course, and I think these are usually skipped over, but they're very interesting, um, he intends his analysis of neoliberalism to be in line with his other great studies of sexuality, criminality, and madness. So what interests him is the emergence of the market as a site of truth, or what he calls veridiction. So from where do we get the idea, which is now a kind of political and a journalistic commonplace, that the market speaks? You know, that the market gets nervous or excited, that it makes demands, emits signs, expresses its preferences and desires, like moi le marché, je parle. Okay. Now, in one of the last sessions, so of the course, Foucault traces the emergence of the market as a site of, again, veridiction, uh, back to Adam Smith's famous figure of the invisible hand. And it may be surprising to see the sympathy with which Foucault interprets the significance of this figure. So contrary to the standard Marxist approach, which views the invisible hand as a kind of new figure of providential theology or capitalism as religion, Foucault actually sees it as the expression of a radical atheism. So the invisible hand is what exercises, you know, quote, any form of overarching gaze and prohibits, quote, the political totalization of the economic process. And just as a side note, I think today the invisible hand of the market should be supplemented by two additional figures. Um, on the side of consumption, there's something like the invisible hand job of the market, um, which would be capitalism's polymorphous perversity, you know, the pleasures it peddles, and the dissatisfaction it feeds on. So for capitalism to function, it both needs to provide so pleasure in the form of commodities, but it also needs to feed a certain dissatisfaction or discontent. And the second figure, I think, regarding the dismantling of social protections and privatizations um, that are prosecuted by austerity politics, we have the all too visible chopping block of the market. So, now my first point, so my first point with respect to um, Foucault's lecture course, I think what's very interesting, you see here that the market for him competes with the panopticon as a paradigm for social organization. So instead of the social field being kind of surveyed and controlled from a central point of observation, it is self-organized from below through a multiplicity of transactions without any single individual able to master the field in which he operates. So what Foucault wants to show is how what he calls a detotalized totality or an untotalizable totality. Um, so the detotalized totality of market transactions becomes a new source of authority and the limiting principle of politics. So from the rule of the sovereign, we arrive at the anonymous reign of the market. Okay, this story is actually pretty well known. The market dethrones the juridical authority of the traditional master and replaces it with the neutral constraint of knowledge. Okay, so the political sovereign is replaced by the administrator or the manager. Now what I want to highlight is how Foucault sketches, though he doesn't really elaborate this, but he could have, it's interesting. So Foucault sketches a kind of tension in modernity between two exemplary figures of discipline. The perfect surveillance and control from above, so that's as embodied in Jeremy um, Bentham's Panopticon, and a self-generating order that is unmasterable and follows its own internal logic according to Adam Smith's invisible hand. So, the one is a figure of total exposure and invisibility, and the other a figure of sprawling kind of subterranean connections and invisibility. So the visible, so we have kind of the visible and the invisible, as it were. Um, is modernity caught between two competing fantasies? On the one hand, total transparency and submission to the one, and on the other, a detotalized multiplicity whose chaos gives rise to order on the other. Okay. My second point. Now, the other problem that the Foucault does not, in my, in my view, sufficiently analyze, though he hints at it, is the way that the market as a site of veridiction, again, a site for truth-telling, uh, differs from those other great sites of the modernist will to truth, such as madness, sexuality, and criminality. So the market stands opposed to these other regimes of veridiction in that it no longer involves a hermeneutics of desire, and thus it cannot be understood according to the model of confession, which, as we know, Foucault um, generally privileges. Uh, instead, of, so instead of desire and its interpretation, there is interest and its enumeration. So unlike desire, which uh, interest is expressed in numerical form as the aggregated sum of choices represented in market data. So the site of truth is not a source of deep meaning, 
Um, it's not the revelation, let's say, of one's being, the secret of one's being, but just consists in a meaningless string of numbers. Um, in Deleuze and Guattari's terminology, codes of meaning have been replaced by an axiomatic of numbers. So in this way, there's kind of an odd short circuit between religion and atheism or piety and profanity. You know, is the market our new god? Or does its ascendance mark the advent of a properly atheistic modernity? I think he leaves this um, question open. Um, the market effectively cuts off the head of the king, but only in order to replace it by the diffuse principle of money and economic knowledge as power. Now, I'm going to come back to this point later, towards the end of my talk, um, regarding the significance of money and this kind of momentous shift whereby the locus of truth is no longer desire but interest and entails, again, a technique not of interpretation but counting. So I think the birth of the market, let's say, la naissance du marché, the birth of the market, might have been a better title um, for Foucault's lectures or a book based on them. So we could almost imagine a sort of virtual book that Foucault didn't write, the kind of birth of the market. Um, and this book would have been a genealogy of money uh, or a study that illuminates the historical formation and the ramifications of that old adage that money talks. And my point would be something like, um, that money doesn't talk in the same way as the desiring soul does in the Christian confessional or the divided subject in the psychoanalytic clinic. So we should try to understand what it means when money becomes the measure of desire and when desire is socially determined as a desire for money. So just to be clear, I'm not on board with those critics who think that Foucault is somehow a crypto neoliberal or that Foucault is a kind of apologist for neoliberalism, but I want to show that actually he hits on some very interesting problems that he just leaves aside and doesn't develop that could have problematized some of his notions. So the idea that there's a tension between the panopticon and the market for understanding modern discipline or the problem of what does it mean when money becomes the site of truth. So I think he opens the door for an interesting problem, but himself doesn't really pursue it. Okay. Now, I'd like to go a step further than this genealogy of the market as a site for truth-telling, a step that I think is, you know, barred, basically, by Foucault's own theoretical framework. So neoliberalism should be understood not only as an economic doctrine and as an art of government, but also as a particular image of the human being. It's a philosophy of the individual in the mirror of capital. With the extension of capital to the human being in the form of human capital, so Gary Becker and others, uh, University of Chicago is very important in this story, we all become little firms, um, capitalist enterprises unto ourselves. So our proper names, our brands, our brands, um, themselves the bearers of value. Our skills, knowledge, and expertise are our investable funds demanding growth and renewal. And our egos are the product of self-valorization and self-estimation acid tested in the competitive marketplace of human subjectivity. And this general picture is well known today. I'm not saying anything new here. Um, but I would just like to highlight, okay, how this could be broken down into different components that mimic, in an odd way, they mimic a full-fledged theory of the subject. So we have the name, a symbolic inscription. We have the body of the drives, so that would be one's capacities and powers, and the self-estimation or the self of self-estimation and self-appreciation, so the idealized ego. And regarding the first point, I think it would be interesting to sketch, I mean, I think one could sketch a whole theory of the proper name, um, a psychoanalytic theory of the proper name in light of its different pathological expressions up to and including its contemporary capitalist variant. So, first, there's the neurotic relationship to the name. You know, am I really what they're calling me? Uh, the problem of identifying with one's interpolation and just more broadly of situating oneself in an already given tradition. Um, then there's the schizophrenic sort of approach to the name. So where I name myself, I'm the creator of my own name. Uh, the schizophrenic is extremely sensitive to the moment of initiation, of creating something new. So you can think of, of Artaud with Artaud le Momo, so he, he renames, rebaptizes himself, or of Lacan's uh, analysis of Joyce, where he emphasizes the idea that Joyce, through his literature, sort of creates himself, gives himself his own name. Okay. Then uh, this would be followed by the pervert. And here I would highlight the interesting fact that perversions tend to be named after particular individuals, like Sakar Masak or Saad, uh, or even Kafka. So what does the Kafkaesque name? The Kafkaesque names a kind of certain stylized atmosphere of suffocation and nightmarish bureaucracy, the perversion of the law. So perversion 
is when the proper name is kind of raised to the level of the thing. When it names no longer a person, but a style and aesthetics or a repeatable form. Okay. So again, if in neurosis, the question is whether one corresponds with one's name, and of course the, the lesson in a way, the, the, the genius, the lesson of neurosis is that all identity is, is mistaken identity. So you could say, you know, sometimes I'm mistaken for another person and at other times I'm mistaken for myself. But there's always a kind of minimal mistake in identity because identity is not something spontaneously generated but is essentially granted, given by the other. So there's always kind of a minimal degree of alienation in any sense of mindness. So this is really the insight of neurosis, okay? So, Again, if in neurosis the question is, do I correspond with my name? In schizophrenia, the proper name is a kind of creation ex nihilo. So this idea that I am so far sort of thrown outside of any possible tradition that I have to reinvent in a delusional way a new tradition in which I can find myself. So it's kind of creation ex nihilo. In perversion, the name becomes something that escapes the person so as to designate some impersonal symptomatic formation. So you could say, it, it escapes my name, and my name escapes me. So in Freudian terms, the name is no longer attached to the ego but the id, so that it becomes a kind of improper proper name. Okay, and finally, at the end of this story, there's what um, we might call Facebook. Um, you should like my name, and we can generate cash value out of that. In contemporary capitalism, the name is first and foremost a brand. So it's not something that situates one, however uneasily, in the space of social recognition, but rather something that can generate surplus value. And brands, I think brands today are no longer names of commodities, let's say, in the, in the, as it was in the post-war, the great post-war period, let's say 50s through 70s, the, the golden sort of age of advertising uh, explored in that wonderful TV series, Mad Men. So I think you know, brands are no longer just names of commodities with a kind of halo of attractive associations. But in an inversion, it is proper names that now function as brands, designating the self as commodity. So to have a name means today, first and foremost, to possess the potential for value. And I would further add that, you know, I think one of the very Warholian um, fantasies of contemporary capitalism is that one would no longer have to work at all, but that one's name would just have a career on its own. It would just autonomously sort of generate surplus value via its mediatic reproduction. Okay, so this is just a sketch, but I think one could fill this out for, for, for what I would consider to be a sort of psychoanalytic or, or even Freudian marxist like theory of the proper name. Okay. Now, it would be a mistake, though, it would be a mistake to identify the neoliberal subject solely with the entrepreneurial branded self. The underside of the creative, flexible, self-affirming, enterprising individual lies in the social imperative to take charge of and manage one's risks, to assume one's precarious existence without any fallback or any guarantee in society, which, as we know, does not exist, or the big other, which should not be supposed. And, you know, ironically, I think the big other today seems to exist only to proclaim its non-existence. So kind of contra the Thatcherite formula, you know, there's no such thing as society. Um, you could say that the ultimate proof of society's existence is the force by which it announces its own non-existence and then goes on to prove it via an institutionally managed programs of austerity and privatization. I mean, I think there's some kind of deep irony here. The, 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 the ultimate proof of society is in fact its own dismantling in, in some sense. Now, in neoliberalism, the capacity for self-management and self-creation goes together with anxiety-ridden exposure and a kind of existential precarity. So capitalism today, in its more naked or pure form, um, and I guess, you know, maybe to be clear, I guess I would say something like this, that, um, that in earlier stages of capitalism, let's say 19th, 20th century, you essentially get adulterated forms of capitalism or capitalism always in a kind of compromise with some other social formation. But today, I think this is one of the traits of neoliberalism, that capitalism somehow emerges in a more sort of pure, absolute, or naked form, uh, especially after the sort of defeat of communism. So in... in, in um, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, because capitalism itself no longer has to compete, let's say, with any other theory ideology. And I think this is also a deep irony that for essentially what is a theory of competition, capitalism itself has become monopolistic. And, you know, you could say, and this is not Marxist, this is just according to capitalism itself, the ideology of capitalism, um, by its own criteria, 
it should therefore become inefficient, decadent, and should die off. This, this is not a Marxist. This is according. If you take the capitalist idea that it's a theory, that the marketplace is essentially based on competition, the moment in which capitalism itself becomes a monopolistic ideology, it should therefore die by its own criteria. Again, this is not a Marxist claim, but a cap strictly capitalist claim. Anyway, so I think today what we see emerging is a more naked or pure form where capitalism doesn't feel like it needs to compromise um, because you know it's the only game in town, as it were. So, the corollary to this, or the kind of conclusion I, I draw and see if you find this convincing, but I, I think capitalism is less concerned today with peddling fantasies of happiness and enjoyment than in recalling the subject to its inherent nullity. So its subjects are interpolated not so much through the promise of a place in a prosperous system or even the very unlikely chance of such a place, so the American dream, as threatened with the prospect of waste and nothingness. So I think actually capitalism also becomes much more honest today in a sense. Um, so I think we're sort of directly interpolated as waste and as nothingness, but, and here's the twist, a nothingness which is sold to these very subjects as if it were their salvation. So if only one were able to adapt to one's true nature, in other words, if only one were able to adapt to one's disadaptedness, you would be saved. For it is precisely by being nothing or just being there right, to cite the title of the great Peter Sellers film, that one could become anything. So in this way, neoliberalism seems to speak the language not so much of economics as philosophy, or rather a kind of strange parody of philosophy. For it too proclaims, neoliberalism, it too proclaims that being is becoming and that existence precedes essence. It defends the radical openness and plasticity of the human being, and on an ethical level, it demands that the subject assume responsibility for its abyssal freedom. This is why contemporary critics like Paolo Virno and Bertrand Ogilvy, to cite the most nuanced and provocative, and if I was to really develop this thesis, I would have to, I mean, I would be interested to reconstruct their positions. I'm just going to mention them and let me say, summarize in my own terms, but I think for me, these are two of the most interesting critics today, Virno and Ogilvy. They argue that neoliberalism amounts to a new form of voluntary servitude in which the subject is captured not in a way that ideologically distorts or conceals its negativity, historicity, and freedom, but that directly appeals to these revolutionary qualities and mobilizes them in the service of the market. So capitalism imitates and absorbs human nature, human nature itself, or better, it presents itself as the economic form that is truly adequate to or perfectly corresponds with this nature. So is capitalism a humanism? And in fact, that would be the better, I realize this is a better title for my paper today. So that would, is capitalism a humanism? And now, unlike Foucault and closer to a Marxian inspiration, to understand the problem of truth-telling in the realm of economics, it has to be situated at the intersection of political economy and the 20th century tradition of philosophical anthropology. Okay, what do I mean by philosophical anthropology? So, for my purposes here, I, 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 it's a bit imprecise term, but I think that's okay for, for this lecture. So, by philosophical anthropology, I just intend a loose conglomeration of existentialism, structural anthropology, psychoanalysis, and the German school of philosophical anthropology all of which undertook a radical critique of human nature in order to rethink the basic structures of subjectivity, desire, history, the body, intersubjectivity, culture, and so on. And the goal of this, again, kind of loosely consolidated intellectual enterprise should be understood in political terms. Um, the philosophical conception of the human being, as a, again, as a being whose existence precedes its essence, defined by its radical openness and fundamentally historical character, was for the 20th century part and parcel of an emancipatory project aimed against all kinds of naturalisms and identitarian politics. So as opposed to having a pre-given goal or a natural destination or some kind of substantial identity which it could assert and defend, human existence is always in the process of inventing itself, of becoming something other to itself, and is compelled to assume its abyssal freedom with all the risks and difficulties this entails. Now that conception has been decisively reversed. Neoliberalism can be defined from the perspective of philosophical anthropology as a perverse exploitation 
of the indetermination of the human being, whose flexibility, capacity for reinvention, and underlying precarity are now marshaled in the service of the market. And paradoxically, the very openness that was meant to combat reification has itself now become the object of reification. So a vector for the reduction of the human being to a manageable thing, something saleable, exchangeable, and ultimately disposable. And one might say that this reversal is the great corruption of our times, the hijacking of an emancipatory ideal into a new form of voluntary servitude. And I think that critical theory has yet to fully reckon with the ramifications of this reversal. So the way that a certain previous political debate in the 20th century has really been displaced. Um, this teaches an important lesson that the, somehow the indetermination of human existence is itself politically indeterminate. Let me, say, let me explain that a bit more. Um, I think it can be appropriated by the left or the right for a revolutionary politics or for reactionary entrenchment. And indeed, neoliberal capitalism has effectively confused the political debate that characterized 20th century philosophical anthropology okay, between those who saw that the indetermination of human existence as a reason for defending strong institutions, right? You could, you could um, draw the conclusion that if the human uh, being is essentially precarious, fragile, self-inventing in a process of becoming, one should therefore defend the tradition and strong institutions in order to protect it against disorientation and panic. So you could draw that conclusion or the opposite conclusion. So those who insist on the non-natural and thoroughly historical character of institutions um, makes them amenable always to critique and revision. And in this regard, just to mention a small episode, but a very interesting one, in this regard, a 1965 radio debate between Theodore Adorno and Arnold Galen is kind of a highly telling episode. Then you really see what the theoretical dispute was uh, uh, based on some, let me say, similar um, philosophical commitments, okay? Now, this relatively clear-cut opposition between a conservative and a progressive positions, I think has now been confused as both parties today speak a progressive or radical language, both the left and the right insist on the self-revolutionizing nature of the human being, but to different ends. And to complete this picture, part of what makes neoliberalism such a dominant system is not only that it perversely exploits this indetermination or ontological precarity, but it also mobilizes a powerful apparatus for reinterpreting the subject's lack of being and giving it a specific form, namely debt. So to sum it up, just to sum it up in a formula, if the Freudian name for the unhinged or the out of joint character of the psyche was death drive, then neoliberalism can be understood as a translation of death drive into debt drive, a transformation of the obstinate openness of the human being into kind of a perpetual indebtedness. And ultimately what the neoliberal subject is indebted to is neoliberalism itself which ceaselessly tells us that we should support, affirm, and even be grateful for a system that owes us nothing in return. So contemporary capitalism, I think, cynically affirms the subject's autonomy while massively reinforcing its dependence and passivity. Okay, I, in order to, to, to better understand this crossing, let's say, of philosophical anthropology and political economy, um, I'm gonna make an extended digression into an unlikely source, the fictional universe of Franz Kafka. So Kafka's last story, um, completed just before he died, Josephine the Singer or the Mouse People, Mouse Folk, is a story about art and its relation to the community, told through the perspective of the Mice People and their beloved, if irascible, conceptual <laughs> performance artist named Josephine. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details of the story, I just want to focus on one particular aspect, kind of a peculiar aspect of Kafka's Mice, uh, mice People, um, the point at which they are at their most animalian and thus far removed from the human, and yet at the same time uncannily close, I think, to contemporary human existence. So as the narrator of the story informs us, mice, so the mice in the story, they don't have any youth, or they have practically no youth. Um, quote, our life happens to be such that a child, as soon as it can run about a little and distinguish itself um, from, from another, uh, must look after itself just like an adult. Children have no time to be children, okay, end quote. Now the consequence of this incredibly compressed infancy is that the mice people are simultaneously infantile and elderly. Um, because they don't have a chance to really grow up, but they're pressed almost immediately into the charged world of duties and responsibilities, they become prematurely old. So they kind of pass from being hapless infants to crusty old timers. 
Um, or rather, the peculiarity of their condition is such that they possess the characteristics of both at the same time. So I read a couple passages um, from the story. As the narrator explains, a kind of unex unexpended, ineradicable childishness pervades our people. In direct opposition to what is best in us, our infallible practical common sense, we often behave with the utmost foolishness, with exactly the same foolishness as children, senselessly, wastefully, grandiosely, irresponsibly, and all that um, often for the sake of some trivial amusement. Yet our people are not only childish, but we are also, in a sense, prematurely old. We have no youth, we are all at once grown up, and then we stay grown up too long. A certain weariness and hopelessness spreading from that leaves a broad trail through our people's nature." End quote. Um, so mice are foolish, impulsive, irresponsible, they're overexcited, but they're also rigid, they're set in their ways, they're narrow-minded, they're tired, they're hopeless, so kind of the worst of both worlds, as it were. Um, the practical nature, you could say, of the mouse is fraught by a kind of infantile senility or a senile um, infancy. So mouse life is hard, it's dictated almost entirely by the struggle for existence, and yet, in a kind of crucial detail, it's almost as if the mice were so busy that they no longer knew what this hubbub was all about. So that despite their kind of hard-headed pragmatism or their infallible practical common sense, it's difficult to say what is actually motivating or driving them. So another quote from Kafka, this mass of people are always on the run and scurrying hither and thither for reasons that are often not very clear, end quote. So I think there's something very interesting here, that something about the nature of business um, um, which is interesting to reflect on. I think busyness has a tendency to become a strange kind of end unto itself, and this is somehow the secret truth of practicality. It's un impractical excess. So somehow we're, we're almost always more busy than we need to be in order to take care of business. And that is the real mystery, I think, of busyness. So one could make a distinction between business as a kind of means and relationship and like busyness. Um, this is also something that um, Eric Santner uh, has, has, has worked on in, in, his new, um, in his new book. Um, I also think, incidentally, that this is a key problem. I think the person who really um, identified this problem, a, a kind of philosophical question, was Norman O'Brown. Um, Norman O'Brown's question, so in his book, um, um, life against death was why are people compelled to work in excess of the labor that's necessary to fulfill needs and wants you know what drives the compulsive excessive work of human beings and he has a remarkable answer I mean he argues that this is not just a feature of let's say capitalism but it's somehow inherent to the human condition to work excessively and he has a remarkable answer that you need to work you know in excess of your needs in order to have something to give away because giving something away is the fundamental uh, uh, manner in which you create a social bond. Okay, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Norman O'Brown later. But anyway, I think that's a very interesting question. That somehow the mice people are very practical, but yet you don't really know why they're so busy. And this is a, somehow, I think, a trait of our contemporary society as well. So again, the mouse people live, uh, move and live within a kind of endless presence. So they're oriented by the imperative survival, and they're always under pressure from the arrival of new generations of mice, because mice are nothing if not fertile. Now, this frenetic pace is the very opposite of human development. Okay? According to the theory of neoteny, Human beings are unique among animals in their premature birth and their extended infancy. So a slowed down, retarded, you know, de not decelerated development is the key feature of human ontogenesis. And it's as if mankind were caught in a kind of permanent transitional phase, so that human beings are you know, definitively unfinished, if I can use that beautiful phrase of Duchamp. Okay. So human life is one long process of education and re-education, the continuous refashioning of nature by second nature. And in contrast to this, you know, the mice are not educated. As the narrator says in this story, we have no schools. Okay. So the developmental process in the mice is abruptly short-circuited, and therein lies the sad lot of the mouse folk. They possess neither the plasticity of youth nor the wisdom and prudence of experience, but are taxed with the negative traits of both, childlike foolishness and senile exhaustion and rigidity. Now, with a little imagination, I think this diagnosis might appear as an uncannily apt description, a very prescient description of the contemporary rat race. Um, and what I mean by this, okay, is not only that people are extreme, today are extremely busy, often just like mice for reasons that are ambiguous and unclear, but um, something more specific. 
the mice's sped up infancy and their premature agedness could be read, again, as a kind of parable of life in neoliberal capitalism, where the infantile traits of precarity and flexibility, plasticity, are captured for the most sclerotic and stultifying ends. And I think the great irony of Kafka's description of mouse existence, you know, this is the great irony of it, that it's when the mouse people appear most developmentally distant from human beings, that they exemplify the contradictions of capitalist culture, late capitalist culture, wherein subjectivity appears as an immediate identity of plasticity and rigidity, of openness and closure, or of childishness and senility. So the key question for today, I think, becomes, you know, what would it mean to escape this decrepit infancy? What would it mean to finally become an adult? Okay. Um, now, I believe, I, I, to, shift, to shift a little bit, to shift the question a little bit, I, I believe we can deepen the foregoing analysis by turning to one of the most highly conspicuous aspects of contemporary capitalism that neither Ogilvy no, nor Virno um, directly deals with, and that's the problem of debt. And herein also lies the key contribution of Freudo-Marxism. So the main thrust of Freudo-Marxism is usually thought to be the liberation of desire. I think this is the, let me say, the, the kind of cliched idea we have of what Freudo-Marxism was about, the liberation of desire. So the alienation of labor and the repression of sexuality go hand in hand, so that a revolutionary politics will be at the same time a movement of libidinal emancipation, leading to an efflorescence of the unheard of pleasure potentials of the human body. And Lacan uh, derided this, famously derided this in a wonderful phrase as sexo-leftism. Um, sexo-leftism, where the celebration of hedonism actually takes on a compulsory character and feeds the capitalist imperative to enjoy. So in this way, um, according to this diagnosis, and there's, there's a great truth to this, uh, psychoanalysis somehow historically became the dupe of narcissistic consumerism and its commodification of non-conformity and self-actualization. And if you, if you want to get a sort of condensed version of this story, you know, I can highly recommend to look at Adam Curtis's documentary, The Century of the Self, which basically tells this story. It's a very negative picture of psychoanalysis, how psychoanalysis became the dupe of consumer society. So this was what Lacan calls sexo-leftism. Now, I think this is really the absolutely incorrect picture of Freudo Marxism and is not what Freudo Marxism was, was about um, fundamentally. So, in contrast to this, I would argue that the authentic basis of Freudo Marxism lies in Freud's idea that debt and guilt stand at the origin of civilization and that its adherents have developed this insight into the most profound meditation on the nature of debt and guilt ever produced. And this is the hardcore of Freudo Marxism, and it's also the crucial starting point for a possible renewal of Freudo Marxism in the 21st century. So this is, let me say, this is my extremely ambitious idea. That I think, I mean, we should, we should try to think what a renewal of Freudo Marxism, the Freudo Marxist project, would be in the 21st century. And, and let me, just to put my cards on the table, I mean, I think there's, there is effectively three great, maybe three great kind of intellectual movements in the 20th century in, in critical thought, uh, phenomenology, structuralism, and Freudo Marxism. And I think, like Freudo Marxism, which today almost is laughable. I mean, even when I'm talking to my like, some close colleagues, I mean, at one point, I even suggested for a title of a conference, why don't we just call it Freudo Marxism in the 21st century? They thought you can't do that. It's, it's too ridiculous. So I think we should try to think what a Freudo Marxism of the 21st century could be. And I think the starting point is to affirm that the, the, the most interesting Freudo Marxist thinkers have tried to meditate on the nature of, of guilt and debt. That's the real starting point. Okay. Uh, so, again, to, to repeat myself, I would not start neither with the problem of sexual liberation nor with, and I think this is blown all out of proportion, but of course you can find certain people who argued this in 60s and 70s. It's neither about the kind of celebration of madness as a kind of redemption from a repressive and alienated world. You can find this idea, for example, in R.D. Lang, but I think even R.D. Lang is a much more interesting figure than this kind of cliched uh, version of him we have today. Um, but again, the intractable problem of debt and guilt, which today, of course, takes on a special resonance in the wake of the financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis. So in this regard, let me just mention two key works in the Freudian Marxist tradition that I think can help us better understand this. Again, Norman O. Brown's Life Against Death, The Psychoanalytic Meaning of History from 1959, and um, Deleuze and Guattari's Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, published in 1972. Closely connected by their socio-historical concerns and their ambitious sweep, the latter book 
um, may be seen almost as a kind of development and expansion of the former. Both books are heavily indebted to Nietzsche and aim to revitalize Freudian psychoanalysis with a more Nietzschean take on the bodily drives and a return to his theory of the creditor-debtor relation as the kernel of anthropogenesis or of human civilization. And of course, in this revitalization, Brown retains the name of psychoanalysis while Deleuze and Guattari want to replace it with schizoanalysis. Okay, now as far as I know, Deleuze and Guattari never read Norman O. Brown. Brown, however, mentions them in a lecture from the 80s where he calls anti-Oedipus, quote, that last ambitious fling at a Freud-Marx synthesis. Now, I do a little advertising for my own because I'm doing a couple lectures next week and I'm going to look at Norman O. Brown. So I'm very interested in returning to, um, to Brown to see what kind of insights can be mined there and how to update, I think, Brown's project, let me say, with a certain Lacanian slant. But I think that book is a very interesting and essentially forgotten book today. I mean, really, a forgotten book. Um, and very quickly, um, I'm just going to highlight what I think are the two most interesting aspects of this consolidated endeavor. So I'm not actually laying out all my arguments, but I'm trying to lay out an outline for what I think would be the most productive, let's say, um, path to further research. So what I think are the two most interesting sort of aspects of both of these books, so Life Against Death and Anti-Oedipus, are that both elaborate a universal history, a universal theory of history, as debt history. So that is, they understand the development of different forms of human civilization. I mean, starting with like primitive, so-called primitive man up through capitalism. So they understand the development of different forms of, of human civilization in terms of the changing relationship to debt and guilt. So that goes effectively for both thinkers in three, fa in three phases. It goes from limited debt relationships, which are managed by rituals and sacrifices, to an infinite and unpayable debt. We heard about this yesterday in Milan Dolar's talk. So an infinite and unpayable debt that then corresponds to the rise of an internal bad conscience or superego. And finally, to a world where debt in the form of credit money has become the imminent principle of social organization, not a transcendent principle, but an imminent principle of social organization, and guilt has become not erased, but guilt has become unconscious. So this is kind of the broad story that both thinkers tell with different, um, let me say, with different accents, and especially with different understandings of the role of religion in this. But I think that's a very interesting to reconstruct that would be very interesting and productive today. And of course, it's Maurizio Lazzarato, so in his book on the indebted man, essentially takes his argument, his starting point is actually the Deleuze Guattarian idea of history as a debt history. And that was actually a really radical, interesting, uh, fresh, let's say, perspective in the 1970s. Okay. Um, in one sense, I could even say that that um, in a funny way, Lacan kind of missed the boat on, the, on this line because this puzzles me because Lacan in the 50s has a very profound, interesting meditation on the nature of symbolic debt. But he never connected, as far as I know, he never connected his ideas, his earlier ideas with debt to his later, um, his later reflections on the nature of capitalism or capitalist discourse. And I think that's a certain weakness in, in Lacan himself. Okay, so that's the first point. Um, you could say for Brown and Deleuze and Guattari, debt is what drives history. And the second point that I think is interesting is they both propose to analyze the origin of economy not in terms of barter or logic of exchange, but rather starting from the impasses and internal troubles, the internal restraint, constraint of human desire. Again, we heard about this yesterday in uh, Milan Dolar's talk. And you could say economy, economy in the most basic sense, is a way, it's a strategy, for handling the troubles of desire and instituting a manageable relation to the other. And that's what economy is about. Okay? And then one could say that the great irony is that the means that are meant to tame and domesticate desire actually end up becoming the most unruly and unmanageable thing. This is the great sort of irony um, that we confront today um, in neoliberal capitalism. And, uh, um, Maybe I could, I'm, I'm kind of slowly winding to conclusion. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say one other, let me say, one other thing um, about Brown, uh, how he sets up the problem. I mean, broadly speaking, you can say that philosophers of desire usually have one or the other picture. The most common picture of, of desire, definition of desire, is that desire is some kind of power or capacity of the body. Um, the problem is, I have a desire, how to satisfy it? Maybe my desire is infinite, it can never be satisfied, maybe I enjoy the dissatisfaction of desire, but the fundamental problem for a wide variety of thinkers is, you know, 
how do I get what I want in some sense? And you could say the second I, uh, starting point for thinking desire, much less common, is that um, desire starts in a kind of not direction towards some kind of satisfiable you know, um, object, but desire starts in a kind of chaos, a kind of panic or anxiety, that one doesn't even know how to start desiring in the first place. That the fundamental problem of desire is how to escape an initial position of dependence on the other and passivity. And this, I think, is the position. So this, I think, is the position defended by, by a minority of thinkers. Um, it's developed, of course, by Lacan, by Brown, um, actually by Levinas in his early works. The fundamental problem of desire is escaping from some kind of impasse. So how to begin desiring in the first place, not presuming desire as an already given power of the body. And Brown's, um, Brown's thesis is that you know, the body it both has a kind of polymorphous perversity along Freudian lines. It can find a spontaneous pleasure in itself and in the world. But at the same time, because of the human infant's helplessness and its total dependence on the other, um, it finds itself trapped in a situation of utter passivity. So again, tr uh, a kind of dependence on the, the capricious whims of the other. And in order to will itself out of that situation, it develops a fantasy. And its first fantasy is a fantasy where it can control its relation to the other. And economy will essentially be an elaboration of that fantasy of controlling one's relation to the other. Okay. So I think this is an interesting starting point for rethinking what economy is and a much more productive and a much more nuanced picture of economy than starting from the idea that I make something, somebody else makes something, we should get together and exchange on some neutral territory. That economy, in fact, is rooted in the impasses of human desire. Okay. Now, I... I I, what time? I have uh, about 10 more minutes, 5 more minutes? Okay, good. I, I wind to a conclusion. So the psychoanalytic variant of philosophical anthropology is what I would call clinical anthropology. Clinical anthropology understands and analyzes the human condition from the perspective of psychopathology. That's the real, that's the great strength of, of psychoanalysis, I think. Um, for this tradition, man is the sick animal. And the theoretical horizon of Freudo Marxism is to articulate a kind of clinical anthropology of capitalism. Now, this project has often taken the form of determining which pathological type corresponds with life under the conditions of capitalist economy, as if capitalism possessed a specific spirit or kind of mandatory form of subjectivity. So, is it the neurotic worker who accumulates money and devotes his or her life to work while perpetually postponing enjoyment? Is it the perverse consumer who's caught between a kind of depressive emptiness and a manic enthusiasm under the superego imperative to enjoy? Or are we, all, are we all rendered schizophrenic to one degree or another by the wild flights of money that volatilize social reality and which respect no codes or bonds or territories except the further self-generation of money? Now, in the sociological literature, uh, we can identify, I think, if you review the sociological literature, especially in, in, in American sociology in the post-war era, uh, I think we can identify four broad character types which correspond to different phases of capitalism. You have the organization man of conformist kind of 1950s style capitalism. Again, uh, Mad Men is a very good uh, kind of reference for understanding the aesthetics of this. So the organization man of conformist 1950s style capitalism. Then you have the narcissistic self-actualizing consumer. I think there was a question yesterday about self-actualization. So we have the narcissistic self-actualizing consumer that conforms to a certain image of non-conformity that's much discussed in the literature from the 1970s, Chris Link, Christopher Lash, and so on. Then you have the entrepreneurial self of neoliberalism, so the subject as a speck of human capital. And then, as a further development of that, the precarious, exposed, risk-bearing agent as a dominant form of today. Now, the argument of Virno and Ogilvy is that contemporary capitalism addresses itself not so much to a particular character type as to generic humanity. So it captures the human being at its most fundamental level in its inessential essence or its denatured nature, and it directly deploys this ontological precarity as a vector for exploitation. So is it not the case is it not the case that capitalism is both compatible with and actively encourages all the major pathological types? So that there's neurotic subjects, perverse subjects, and psychotic subjects all within the global frame of capitalism. Um, the plasticity, the creativity, the uncanny vitality of capital is such that it resists being fit into or confined by any particular spiritual mold. 
Here I would differ, for example, from the classic thesis of Max Weber. Um, but it always finds ways of exploiting different subjective types and fomenting new ones for its own ends. Capital always has specific attachments in any given cultural historical configuration, but in itself, it is detached from any spiritual shape or concrete form, for it is attached to nothing other than its own self-aggrandizement, that is the extraction of surplus value. And this is what I think Deleuze and Guattari mean when they say that capitalism is schizophrenic in its essence, that it has no attachments in itself. Now the Lacanian version of this problem is the question of capitalism's discursive logic. So to which of the four discourses does capitalism belong? Is it defined by the discourse of the master, the discourse of the hysteric, the university, or the analyst? Does it involve some combination of these? Or does it constitute its own unique fifth discourse? Um, again, just to elaborate these questions, do we live in times of generalized perversion? or generalized psychosis, as opposed to Freud's more classically neurotic world, where the ambivalent relation to the law, to authority, is the central discontent. Now, I would argue, so to condense, the, to condense this really just into a, into a thesis, um, I would argue that rather than constituting sort of a particular kind of social link, capitalism overdetermines the operation of the various forms of sociality through its structural similarity with the very openness and negativity that defines the speaking being. So the crucial problem, I think, lies in grasping how capitalism, especially in its contemporary neoliberal, and as I said, its, let's say, pure or naked variant, its pure or naked form, directly mobilizes the speaking being's constitutive lack of being in order to advance a single goal, the valorization of capital. So to put this slightly differently, I think capitalism is not a discourse. Um, it is not a social link, but it's the negative of all social links. And therein lies its contradiction. How to create a social link from out of the negation and volatilization of all social links. And this is the genius of money. This is the genius of money, whose reign is nothing other than the meaningless circulation of the absence of the social link. So like Hamlet's king, money is a thing of nothing. And I'll conclude my talk then by returning to the question, is capitalism a humanism? Now, the response of the neoliberal subject to its interpolation by capital could follow a line, along the lines of the old Freud joke, like, why are you telling me I'm nothing when I really am nothing? And I think this is a more productive, let's say, um, a line to pursue than, uh, or let's say, this is where I oppose kind of liberal attempts to defend a certain non-economic set of human values against the neoliberal triad of excellence, efficiency, and innovation. I think, you know, you find this, for example, in Martha Nussbaum, but also um, articulated, I think, more subtly in um, recent work of Wendy Brown, for instance. This idea to try to save something of the tradition against its neoliberal encroachment, which always has the ring of a certain return to a kind of quasi-Aristotelian uh, uh, theory of virtues. There are certain human virtues that we should defend against their encroachment by, okay, the neoliberal pseudo-virtues of, again, excellence, efficiency, and innovation. We know this uh, mantra. Uh, I think this always has the ring of a losing battle and a rearguard action. And in a sense, capitalism e is more correct. In fact, the subject is a kind of negativity. So why are you telling me I'm nothing when, in fact, I really am nothing? In other words, I think capitalism tells a lie, but in the guise of the truth. And this is the ultimate secret of the veridiction of the market, to go back to Foucault. So if one really wants to elaborate this idea of the truth-telling of the market, I think it lies here, that somehow capitalism lies in the guise of telling the truth. That is, it correctly discerns the negativity, the historicity, and freedom of the subject. It addresses itself, let's say, to the open essence or the denatured nature of the human being. It starts from the Lacanian dictum of the non-relation. And yet it translates this openness, or again, to use Deleuze and Guattari's language, it axiomatizes it in terms of money. So in this way, the plasticity and the potentiality of the human being becomes the pure potentiality of money, a thing whose essence is to be simultaneously nothing and everything. And again, I would refer to Milan Dolor's talk, um, that wonderful quote from Balzac, that money is somehow a kind of pure potentiality. In this way, it, it bizarrely imitates, mimics um, the potentiality of the, of the human being, of the open nature of the human being. Capital is the, wild list, is the wildest, the most wild line of flight. It's a universal becoming monetary. We can thus speak of a continuity. I think we can thus speak of a continuity between capitalism and human nature but only if we recognize the specific twist that capitalism gives to this nature. A twist that should be thought along the lines of Freudian, um, 
or along the Freudian lines of repression, or perhaps even better, disavowal, so fetishism. But I think it also has something quite novel about it, that it can't simply be fit under, in the old categories. If the content of what is repressed in capitalism is human nature itself, it is a repression without a secret, for this content is not only out in the open, but it's shamelessly flaunted and put to work by capitalism. So the secret of this repression lies not in the content, but the form. But the form, too, is out in the open. Money is the form of repression in capitalism. Money is the means of repression. It is the desubstantialized substance of repression itself. So in the guise of riches, money is ultimately what impoverishes us. And I'll end there. There's no questions, right? It's very, You're ready it's for many clear, questions, like, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Aaron, thank you. Um, I was right at the end there, you said something about the secret of human nature is in money. And I was wondering if you meant that the secret of human nature, to go back, is guilt and debt? Someone, okay. Hello? Yeah. Is that what you mean? The secret uh, of human nature? No. Uh, no, no Is no. it guilt and debt? Is that what you no, mean? No, no, no. I mean, okay, then we haven't misunderstood. I mean, what I wanted to say... Well, I wouldn't say... No, it's not... What, what it I'm appears remind, in money. Is it, uh, just, the genius of money is somehow... So, you know, how, the, my question again is going back to how does capitalism seem to have... Oh, let me take a step back. I think... Uh, there's a certain fascination, I think, with capitalism that it's such a wildly successful system. On the other hand, it's the most failed system of human organization ever. It's constantly breaking down, creating misery. It doesn't even function according to its own tenets. It doesn't even take, let's say, its own ideology seriously. So it's really a haphazard, let's say, as Luz and Guattari would say, you know, it functions by breaking down. So my, my question, you know, to my, what I'm trying to understand is how does it have such an, you know, incredible purchase? What is it, where does its power derive from? And I think its power derives from the fact that it's uncannily close to okay, what the critical discourse of the 20th century has developed as a kind of open essence, let's say, of the human being. It somehow imitates that, but it's also found a way to translate that. It's plasticity, or something? plasticity open. So I, I'm having a kind of, I'm, I, I would have to develop this further. I understand that there's a lot of internal debate between the kind of authors I'm generally citing. But for my purposes, the ideas of a kind of openness, plasticity, and indetermination we can use as, a, as kind of synonymous. And that capitalism has found a kind of substance which imitates this plasticity. And that substance is a kind of insubstantial substance, and that's money. So that it's able to translate human plasticity in terms of plasticity of money. And that is somehow the power. The, 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 the purchasing power, the purchase of capital. Can you swap so, that with abstract labor? Because I mean, isn't that the whole point of? Right, money becomes, money the is. The substance of money, abstract labor, is the abstraction of all the potentialities and, you know, the plasticity and so on. I mean, literally, right. Yeah. 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 Aaron, tremendous pleasure to hear this talk again. Uh, it's having a better heard, version. Having now. heard it at uh, <laughs> the University of Chicago a few weeks ago, and now I'm sort of in a paranoid way imagining that the, you know, the Kafka's mice with their enigmatic busyness and their, <laughs> their infantile senility is in fact a depiction of us at the University of Chicago uh, during your stay uh, there. Yeah, yeah but, it's, it's kind but, of meant as a parody. But, but, <laughs> okay, what's gonna... but anyway, um, really what I wanted to to ask you to expand on a little bit is that, so just to walk through a few steps in your argument, mm. um, so very rightly you make this point about needing to get beyond the simplified notion of Freudian Marxism as a kind of liberation sexology, right? And really thinking about guilt and debt as the fundamental uh, problem there. Um, and I think in a way your argument is also implying that we need to get beyond the traditional kind of cliched cr critique of capitalism that went with that was, in a way, the companion or the, the, the companion piece to that simplified notion of Freudian Marxism. 
But where I locate a kind of tension in your argument, mm. I think, is between, um, so this whole argument about capitalism translating the indeterminacy of the human being, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the ambiguity there is about capitalism as a mechanism of capture and capitalism as a mechanism of incitement, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I think you're sort of going down both paths at the same time. And that's not unreasonable. I think you could really make an argument for capitalism as a kind of dialectic of capture and incitement, right? Uh, but then one would have to really kind of render explicit this whole question of capitalism as a relationship between, in a way, an incitement of enjoyment and all the indeterminacies and ambiguities that would go with that, and right. a kind of administration of pleasure, right? Right. Although, you know, again, um, at the moment, I have to say also, this is, a, this is really a new research, so I don't have like a... <laughs> I do, that's why I also I think the form of the paper or what I wanted to present is sort of what I think would be the most productive, let's say, research path. Um, so it's a little bit precipitous right now, but okay. Um, but at the moment, what I find the most fa the most interesting critics again, and I think Paolo Virno, you know, from the Italian um, um, autonomous um, tradition, and, and Berton Ogilvy, who's actually coming from a Lacanian background, you know, has actually been to identify this kind of uncanny similarity between like a neoliberal ideology and actually the old language of critical theory in the 20th century. And I find that, I think that's the most, that's the right insight. So that's why I'm not starting from the idea of capitalism as somehow feeding desire or as the super ego imperative to enjoy, which I think is an important element of the analysis. But for me is actually the second step. Like, the most fundamental is the idea that somehow there's a, there's a uncanny, as if they, they mapped perfectly onto each other this idea of a kind of post-Fordist, like, precarity of work and the ontological precarity, let's say, of the human being, which has been developed, okay, in, let's say, at philosophical anthropology in the 20th century, and to try to understand. So on the one hand, I think I was misunderstood in the early, I'm not saying that, you know, neoliberal, that neoliberalism is somehow Adorno, or that neoliberalism is so, but one should take seriously, it's not simply a kind of misunderstanding or parody, one should take seriously a kind of uncanny closeness, a kind of short circuit. And I think that betrays, like at our, at our historical moment, a more naked expression of what capitalism is. And I think earlier phases of critics of capitalism always tried to understand that capitalism was linked to some kind of substantial commitments, such that if those commitments were thoroughly criticized, changes and so forth, capitalism itself would fall, and I don't, I, I don't think it, capitalism has any substantial commitments. I mean, it always has contingent commitments in any, but it has no, and in that way, it imitates a certain open architecture of the human being as developed in the 20th century. So that's, that's simply the way I lay out the problem. But of course, I mean, I like what you say, a dialectic between a kind of capture and incitement, and one would have to develop that further. But, you know, that's not, at least, that's not my starting point at the moment. Um, that's probably the best I can, yeah, say. Okay, I'm oh, does it work? Yes. Okay, I'm overwhelmed by your talk and my ideas are exploding. I will just try to make very briefly two points. Mm -hmm. First, uh, I think that something that you mentioned at the beginning somehow got lost in this your final euphoria of overlapping <laughs> between human nature. Yeah. As if you, it's very important for me the point you made at the beginning of this double aspect of capitalist modernity. On the one hand, all this self-relying, proliferation, uh, uh, infinite plasticity, and what you tried to cover with that Foucauldian yeah. term of, of uh, panot on control and so on and so on. Now, where do you stand here? Because at some point you almost presented them, at least when you talk about Foucault, as one following the other. I think they are strictly codependent. No, no, no. They, they, oh, sorry. I'll let you finish. Okay. No, no, no. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Now, I then we agree because that, my yeah. point would have been that precisely capitalism the way you formulated it, this, uh, this uh, there is no big other self-reliance, self-reproduction, mm. self-organizing, cannot stand like no free individuals without NSA, to put it in political terms. That this second part, new forms of control and so on and so on, are absolutely crucial. And the same goes for market. It's a very primitive point that I'm making now, but I think it's important. Right. That, uh, okay. 
My first reaction to neoliberalism is sorry. I don't see any neoliberalism today. I see stronger and stronger controlling role of the state, which has to brutally intervene again and again mm -hmm. in order to maintain the appearance of a free market. So, in other words, uh, uh, this is, again, the first problem that I see. Where does the other aspect enter? Let's call it the... the uh, because, you know, Foucault is also very clear here. What he calls panopticon, he makes a beautiful point there. It's not the fact that we are really controlled and so on and so on. Foucault does a wonderful reading of Bentham when he mm. emphasizes we just need some small window where we expect somebody to look at us. But it doesn't really matter if anyone is looking or not. Right. So it's not about out there being controlled. It's that precisely the conclusion would have been that in, in sense, I claim, capitalist liberalism, no matter how it emphasizes chaotic, chaotic, no big other, but there has to be a virtual window where somebody is looking. So for me, right. that, that's the first point. Second point, I, I don't, again, maybe I again miss the point, but when you mentioned this, uh, 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 and it's a wonderful expression, and I fully agree with you at this point of this strange echoing mm. potential identity between what you called, and I know all the irony and so on, human nature as precarious, mm. out of place, and uh, capitalism. But isn't it, Correct me if I am wrong. Isn't it that, at least in the case of Deleuze and Gattari, they still want to save the dream of a possible authentic society where we will have this pl infinitely plastic, deterritorialized human nature at its purest without its capitalist distortion. And they are again and again Emphasize, because what you described so nicely, I found it again and again, not so much in Deleuze as in many Deleuzeans, who has to admit, but wait a minute, what we are celebrating here, plasticity, multi multitude, whatever, but capitalism is already doing it. So then they have to engage in a terrible struggle to prove how, no, 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 capitalism, capitalist deterioration is somehow right. perverted, we should redeem a true deterritorialization. And this for me, here I deeply agree with you, it's exactly the same as what I call, and she's a personal friend of mine, the Judith Butler problem. Right. Okay. You know, she is for me the anthropological but, example. No, we don't have any identities, we infinitely performatively deconstruct ourselves. And whenever I meet her, we go into the same struggle. Because my counter-argument to her is not that, as neoconservatives are saying, there are nonetheless natural sexes, your theory is too crazy. No, my reproach to her is your theory is too normal. Right, okay. There is nothing subversive about it. You're simply describing the predominant mode of subjectivity in our society. So again, where do you stand here? My conclusion would be crazy and radical. We cannot hope to get out of this echoing between capitalism, capitalist dynamics, and the precarity of human nature. I think it's a vain hope to think somehow we can get rid of the bad capitalist perversion mm. and have some pure creative uh, plasticity and so on and so on. We have to drop this anthropology also. Mm. I don't think what is described as this modern, precarious, open, plastic subjectivity. I simply think this should not be our ultimate uh, anthropological horizon. Of course, this does not mean that we should return to some pre-modern, substantial mode of being, but this is not the only choice. Because if this is the only choice, then politically today, the only choice is uh, ultimately, I will be, uh, ultimately uh, the, I don't know, the the new capitalism that is emerging today, so-called Asian values, which is a re right, racist right, term, right. which means substantial capitalism, which works better and better. You in India know it. You are the model. Your leader, Modi, is for me the model of what is in the future. Neoliberal in economics, but Hinduism and so on. Either this or pure wild capitalism. I don't think this covers it all. 
I simply think again that I wouldn't, uh, you, I would, we, together with problematizing capitalism, we should also problematize that type, the way you describe it, of human nature. That right. human nature as infinitely precarious and so on is strictly a historical product. Okay, there's actually three questions there, so let me take let me take all three. So first of all, let me make clear, like what's my approach to Foucault? Like I think there are absolutely wonderful things in that lecture course, and I'm really against the predominant um, interpretation or the way that that lecture course on the birth of biopolitics has been received. Either it's received, you know, minority but but influential position that somehow Foucault is making an apology for neoliberalism. Or either it's considered a kind of hapax that it's not quite Foucauldian because he spends too much time doing intellectual history. It's not as rich as his other micro histories. We need to. We, there's interesting insights, but we need to develop them further. Like like you, the, probably the best reading of that is Wendy Brown's book. So I disagree with both these. I think there are absolutely wonderful things in that lecture course, but weirdly that Foucault himself doesn't develop and that actually complicate his picture of modernity. So to be clear, I think that reading that book, you could get a more uh, nuanced idea of how discipline works in the modern era by saying it's not just the panoptic model. And I think, you know, the vast majority of Foucauldian studies always refer to the panopticon and this kind of fantasy of total surveillance. Again, you're absolutely right. It doesn't have to work empirically, but it works because you become self-surveilling in a sense. That becomes the very kind of core of the Foucauldian idea of, of modernity. But I think here he identifies a tension between two models that are, you know, simultaneous. Simultaneous tension. They go well. Fine. I mean, there's a certain, why tension? Because one emphasizes visibility, the other invisibility. One rep and then you could say, well, of course, they go, they, that, they go together. They necessarily go together. But Foucault himself doesn't develop. So he has this idea of market, and it's clear that the way he describes the market, it's as if it was kind of the inverse of panopticon. But he himself, that's what surprises me, he himself doesn't bring together this insight to say modernity should be seen as, okay, tension between our identity of these two fundamental models. On the one hand, the panopticon, a fantasy of utter transparency and visibility, and the invisible hand. And here I think you can make some progress in bringing these two together to develop something that Foucault himself doesn't develop. You know. So that's my position on, I mean, so it's a, I think that's a different reading actually of that course. So there's kind of these pearls in that course um, that Foucault sort of elaborates in passing, but that don't really affect his general project, and they could have. That's also why I say you could almost read the course as a kind of virtual book that wasn't written. What would the birth of the market have looked like? Okay, so that's my answer to the first question. In this sense, I, I really think we're in agreement that I would read the panopticon and the market as two, indeed, if you don't like, as two figures that kind of, that are opposite figures in some sense, but that go together and express something essential about modernity and power. Okay. Second point about um, there's no neoliberalism today. I mean, okay. Of course, I also agree here that what we see is brutal state interventions in the service of the market. But of course, this is also part of neoliberal ideology because neoliberalism as opposed to liberalism is not a naturalism. So from the beginning, neoliberal, and this is, the, this is what Foucault identifies in the early German debates, is that neoliberalism understood that the market is a state creation. The classical liberalism is the idea that the market is somehow a natural spontaneous formation.